Hello, everyone. So good to see everybody. Didn't get affected by the time change, huh? Yeah, no, I was hitting the snooze a little bit. My wife kicked me out of bed this morning and said, hey, you're preaching. Get out of here. <laughs> We're starting a new series called Close to Jesus. This is week one. I'm so excited about this series. Uh, it's going to culminate with Good Friday and Easter service. And if you have never been part of one of our Good Friday or Easter services, make this a priority because it is absolutely amazing. It's one of my favorite uh, services throughout the year between that and Christmas service. This is a service that you don't wanna miss. Make sure you invite all your friends, your family, your neighbors, start grabbing people off the street, bring them in here and have them part of this service. So today, before we get started, I just want to look back at the camera and say a big welcome to everybody that's watching online, all the men and women in the thousands of correctional facilities all over the United States. We love you. You are not a project to us. You are part of this church family. As we get close to Easter, this was during the time of Passover, and Jesus makes this statement to his disciples which really emanated with me and, and impacted me. And it was a statement of pick up your cross. But it was the timing. We all know that Jesus was very methodical about the way he thought, the way he spoke, the way he released stuff, the way he did stuff. And in the process, this pick up your cross statement, it comes right after the statement of who am I? And then they dive into that, and they believe. And so I'm going to show you something in here, but we're going to, I'm going to take a few minutes to, um, to discuss what the transfiguration was and kind of how that played in this role. And I'm going to give you five ways that the Apostle Paul explained for us to carry our cross. So, but before that, when I was in the military... We were doing a, a hostage rescue up in northern Iraq. And we were trained, we were prepared, we knew how to uh, do these kind of operations, that's what we specialized in. And we're moving out there, we got dropped off from, sh from some Chinooks about three miles away and we started walking into the objective. We were trying to be quiet, trying to sneak into the objective to really get, get these hostages that were being held hostage. And so as we're walking in, we start seeing these holes in the ground. And with these holes in the ground, they have little plastic chairs in them. And they're all flipped over and there's nobody in them. So right away that tells me that they know we're coming. Because they had guards or people sitting out there that were observing us as in our movements coming out to the area. So as we get close to the objective, we have a Specter gunship that's flying above us. And he calls us up on the radio and he says, hey, there's a lot of movement going around on the objective right now. You guys might want to set up your perimeter, back off. And then he did something that you, you only really see in movies. It's funny. So if you have night vision goggles on, the Spectre gunship can shoot this big laser beam out of the sky. And it turns everything almost into daylight. And you can see exactly where the enemy is maneuvering. If you're standing there and you don't have night vision goggles on, it looks like it's pitch black out still. You can't see nothing. So the enemy is moving around, walking around. They're, get, they're setting up an ambush on us, thinking that they're being sly when Inspector Gunship has just turned the lights on them and we're staring at them. They can't, they can't tell that we're staring at them. And so we're able to maneuver around them and then free the hostages successfully. And it didn't turn out too well for the, for the guys that were taking the hostages. But because we were trained, we had faith in our trust, we had a firm foundation. We answered a call to go out and to do this, and then we had a revelation on the site, right? The Spectre gunship shot that laser down and showed us where the enemy was and what they were trying to do. It was our responsibility to be able to maneuver effectively, though. The gunship couldn't maneuver for us when they shined the light down on us. And so we see a mission like this start to unfold with the disciples, in Matthew 16, 24, it says, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone could come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Leading up to the crucifixion, he makes this important statement to his disciples. This, is, this statement is made right after the confirmation of who he is and right before the transfiguration. 
Jesus was very intentional about what he did. And that's why he laid this out. First, the disciples believed. Then he gave them a call to action. Then his glory was revealed. So many of us have this misconstrued and we have this jacked up in our lives. And we say, Lord, if you show up and paint your name on the moon, I'll believe. You put X amount of money in my bank account, I'll believe. You tell this guy to show up with a wacky shirt on, I'll believe. You set all these parameters for God and say, if you do this for me, I will believe. But throughout this, he's showing the disciples, no, the first step, the first step is belief. The first step, step is trust. The first step is confidence in who I am. And once you have belief, then I'm gonna give you a mission. I'm gonna call you to action. And that action is to pick up your cross. Pick up all that stuff, that junk that you're wading around, and you're gonna have to start pushing forward for the kingdom. And once you start doing that, I'm gonna show you some glory. And so what I wanna do is I wanna, I wanna go over the transfiguration story just briefly. I'm gonna spend a few minutes on it so you can see the, the magnitude, the glory, and the reasoning behind this spurring for the disciples and what they did. In Matthew 17, 1, it says, and after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. So let's stop right there. Why did Jesus take Peter, James, and John? We just talked about it a few minutes ago. Because they were the ones that were sitting there and said, who he was. Jesus says, who am I? And the disciples say, well, some say you're, you're Elijah. Some say you're Moses. We've heard other people that say you're John the Baptist. And Jesus says, no. Who am I to you? And they say, well, this is easy. You're the Messiah. You're the one that's come to save your people. You're the one that the scripture talks about that has come back for the Jews. And so they had that, that belief. They knew who he was. And that's why he brought them with up on the mountain and said, okay, you guys believe that I'm the Messiah. Now let me reveal something to you. I love this quote from Oswald Chambers. He says, Jesus Christ never asks anyone to define his position or to understand a creed. But who am I to you? Jesus Christ makes the whole of human destiny depend on a man's relationship to him. This is so true. That's all Jesus wants from us, is a relationship for us to dive in, to have that full trust. When we have a relationship with Christ, everything else is secondary. Jesus chose them because they, had, they wanted a relationship with him. Verse two says, and he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, his clothes became white as light. <clears throat> now this word transfiguration is the word that we get for metamorphosis. And metamorphosis made up of two words, meta, which means it's above reality, and morph to appear different. So Jesus was essentially opening the door to heaven and showing them a picture of what heaven looked like, showing him what the glory of heaven looked like, showing them what his glory looked like while they were on the mountain. Jesus was letting him letting his disciples check this out so that they knew what they were fighting for, but this was also important because it let them know where Jesus was going after his crucifixion. And so it gave them more of a firm foundation to stand on. Verse three says, and there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Why is this important? Because Moses represented the law and the fulfillment of the law. Elijah represented the prophets and all the hundreds of prophecies that were spoken about the Messiah coming. You could do a 50 week study on this verse alone right here, diving into that. And I would challenge you, get into it. Start doing some research on that because it is fun. You'll get, you'll get tied up for days, weeks, months, because there are so many cool prophecies that were written about Jesus out there. We don't have that much time here. They've limited me to 32 minutes, so <clears throat> I have to 
keep pushing forward with that. So Matthew 17, four says, and Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. I never understood the impl- uh, what this verse meant until I really started dissecting it. And it is funny because Peter is a go-getter. And essentially, when he's making this statement, he's putting the cart before the horse. And I'll explain here in just a minute. But it reminds me of so many of us that we go and we get this new shiny toy, right? And what do we do if we're so excited about it? We shuck the directions out, we shuck everything, we lay all the pieces out, we start putting it together because we know how this thing is supposed to look. We ordered it, we want it. We've been, you know, we've been desiring this thing for so long and then all of a sudden you get to the end and you got this one piece left. And you're like, oh man. And so what do we do? We pull out the instruction booklet to see if this is really necessary. <laughs> can, I, can I shuck this or is it important to the operation of this new toy I got? And then when you find out it's important to the operation of the new toy you got, now you're mad. You go pace around the house a little bit. You, you throw your temper tantrum and then you come back and you take the whole thing apart and you put it together the right way, right? I did this just recently with, uh, as some of you know, I'm going back to school right now. I'm getting my doctorate in theology. And the way semesters work now, it's a lot different from when I went back to school back in the day. You had 16-week semesters, and you took your classes for that 16 weeks. Now, I love the way they do it now. So I'll take two classes a semester for 16 weeks, but one of them I take for eight weeks, and the next one I take for eight weeks. So I don't have to take them consecutively like that. So they break it down so you're focusing on that. But what they do is they send you all your books for the full semester and for the classes. And so I was so excited, so pumped up. I love to learn. I love to dive in, especially theology. Theology is, I just love dissecting the cultural, historical, literal uh, data that's surrounded by the Bible. And so my first assignment is this book critique. And so I, I look at my stack of books, said, man, that looks like it's the one right there. And I grabbed it, and I spent a week reading that thing, highlighting, making little tabs and things, writing outlines on the side of it. I was excited. I got ready to start writing my paper, and I pulled up the grading rubric, and the name of the book that I just read was not the name that was on the grading rubric. (laughs) I just spent a week dissecting a book and trying to critique it, and it wasn't even the right book. It forced me to say, okay, John, I know you're excited, but we need to calm down here a little bit. We need, we need to pump the brakes and really make sure that we're doing stuff the correct way. And that's what always happened right here in this story with Jesus and with Peter. Peter was so eager to build these tents. Now, why was this him jumping ahead and putting the cart before the horse? Because back in that day, there was three main festivals that were observed by the Jewish people. You had Passover, which is the first one. That is what is leading up to Easter. That was the next festival to come, was Passover. You have a festival of Shavuot, which was the first fruits. And then you had the third festival, which was Sukkot, which was the ingathering. Now, the ingathering, what they would do is the farmers would go put tents out in their fields because the, when the harvest was getting ready to gather. And so that crooks, um, nobody could go out there and steal their harvest, that they were out there, and as soon as everything was ready, boom, their guys were ready to go, and they started gathering it all up and take it to market. So Peter is skipping over Passover and first fruits, and he's saying, I'm seeing all this glory, I'm seeing Moses, I'm seeing Elijah, I'm seeing an inlet into heaven. This must be the ingathering. Lord, let me build the tents, because I know you guys are getting ready to go out and gather all your people right now. And Jesus is pumping the brakes, saying, ah, we still haven't hit Passover yet, man. Calm down, I like your, I like your drive, but we got a little bit before the ingathering comes. The Passover is what's called for next. And so in verse 7, 5, 17, 5, he says, he was still speaking when behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. The cloud was recognized by all Jews during that time. The cloud led them out through the wilderness 
out of Egypt. The cloud showed up in Isaiah in the temples when they worshiped. It overflowed over them. Every Jew knew what the symbolism of this cloud was. And in the cloud, affirmed Jesus as a son and said, make sure you listen to him. The disciples knew that this was important. In fact, it was so overwhelming for them. In verses six through seven, it says, when they heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, rise and have no fear. And when they lifted their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. The top reason people pass out is they start breathing so heavy, their blood pressure drops, they're overwhelmed, and then boom, they hit the ground. All throughout scripture, you see that anybody that comes face to face with the glory of God, they pass out, right? It is such an experience that you can't even contain yourself. You start hyperventilating. Can you imagine sitting there, seeing the glory of God, seeing heaven's gates opened up in front of you, seeing this transfiguration of Jesus in front of you, and trying to control your breathing, trying to control your blood pressure, and you wonder why everybody just, boom, hits the ground right off the bat. Because there is so much sensory overload that is happening at that moment for it. And so, but Jesus comes alongside and picks them up. He says, hey, come on, stand up. Don't be afraid. Have no fear. We're gonna walk alongside you. The significance of this transfiguration lies in the role as preparation for the crucifixion. It was a glimpse into the glory that awaits him after his suffering and a glimpse for us. Just like that gunship lighting up the area for us, allowing us to see the mission in a whole thing, this was lighting up the mission for the disciples. This was showing them an inlet into God's glory and saying, this is why you need to carry your cross. Your cross may be heavy, it may be burdensome, it may be cumbersome, but you need to pick it up and you need to push forward so you can experience what you're looking at right now. There's three steps again. Those three steps were belief. The disciples believed. And this wasn't that fake belief. One of my favorite stories in the, in the scriptures, Acts 19, Seven Sons of Sceva. If you haven't read this, make sure you dive in. It's one of the best stories out there. I love it. These seven sons of Sceva. So these seven sons of Sceva, they see Paul and Silas casting demons out of people. And they're like, hey, man, that looks cool. We want that ability. And so they approach him, say, how much for that? What do we got to pay? Paul and Silas are, no, you don't have to pray. You have to accept the Lord into your life. And he gives you authority. And so they're like, all right. So they do their little mock-up, check the block prayer. We're good to go. And it says they went and find the biggest, baddest demon they can. And they said, we command you to come out in the name of Jesus, the one Paul prays to. And the demon rears his head and says, Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. But who are you? Right? Jesus knows when our name is written in the book of life, but apparently so did, so did demons. The demon knew he had no authority. In fact, one of the greatest butt kickings in the Bible happens right after that. <laughs> the demon jumps on them, and it says, beats them until they are bloody and naked and run from the house. A lot of you know my past. I used to show people love all the time, but now I love people. And I've been in a lot of fights. And I've been bloody in a lot of those fights. But one thing I've never had happen to me, I've never been naked after a fight. <laughs> These guys were bloody and naked and went running from the house. That's a butt whooping. That tells us how important it is that we have that relationship with Christ, that we are true believers, that we are not those people that are just stepping in the church, checking the block, trying to gain fire insurance. Right? A second point 
was he gave them that call to action to pick up their crosses. And that's what we're gonna focus the majority of today on, is how we pick up our crosses. And then the third thing was he revealed his glory. And so how do we prepare for our crosses? Carrying our cross takes courage. It takes determination. In fact, one of my favorite quotes from Winston Churchill, it says, courage is the first of human qualities because it is the quality which guarantees all others. You can't stand up and do the right thing if you don't have courage. You can't have the hard conversations if you don't have courage. You can't, courage plays a major role in our everyday lives. In fact, God felt so strongly about this that he listed that over 300 times in the Bible. Over 300 times you will see, be strong, be courageous. It is a, it is a vital role to this. Paul, the Apostle Paul, elaborates on this in 1 Corinthians 16, 13 through 14. He gives us five principles on how to carry our cross. The first one is to be on guard. Second, to stand firm in your faith. Third, be courageous. Fourth, be strong. And fifth, do everything with love. So being on guard, a lot of Christians have that misconception. We believe, we give our lives to the Lord, we're good to go, we can go walking across 121, we're not gonna get hit, hit by any cars, right? Because God's gonna float us across 121. We, we have nothing to worry about. But that's the exact opposite. That's the one guarantee that God tells you throughout scripture, is you will have trials. You will have tribulations. And so you must be on guard. Peter tells us that we need to be sober and we need to be vigilant. And vigilance is a key, it's a keen sense of awareness of what's going on. And one of the best stories for vigilance in the Bible is Gideon's 300. Now Gideon is marching an army of 32,000 to fight the Midianites. And it says already that they're outnumbered 100 to 1 with 32,000. So they're already way outnumbered. So he's walking, he's marching his army. The Lord shows up and says, I can't win with 32,000 because if I let you guys win, you are gonna think you did this all on your own. And he says, so go out and tell the army, whoever is fearful, go home. And so they announce it to the army, 22,000 men go home, leaving the army down to 10,000. They're already outnumbered 100 to one, now it's jumped up to about 1,000 to one, right? So, and God says, nah, this is still too many. We need to whittle this down because I need to get the glory for this battle. He says, so take them down to the watering hole. The ones that put their face in the water and drink set off to one side. The ones that grab the water and bring it to their, cup it and bring it to their mouth set off to the other side. Now if you, are a hunter or you've been in the military before, you know why this is important. Because watering holes are prime ambush locations. All, right? all animals, all militaries, they all require water. And so when a good place to set up an ambush is down wherever water is located at. So God was making a picture with this. He was showing them the vigilance that he wants in his army. And he said, the guys that grab the water and cup it up and bring it to their face, those are the vigilant ones. Why? Because when they bent down and they got the water, they brought it to their eyes, their eyes were still on the horizon. They were still looking for the enemy the whole time. They were vigilant, they were keen, they were aware of what was going on. The other guys, they stuck their head in the water. They had no idea what was gonna go on. If someone popped out of the bushes, they would have had no idea and they would have been overrun. So God says, I can do something with those 300. And in fact, next day he walks them down. They surround the enemy camp. They blow ram's horns, throw clay uh, jars on the ground and break them. And God stirs up that massive army and they start killing each other. He didn't even need them to fight, but he was making a point. He was saying, if I'm gonna bring someone to battle with me, that's who I want. 
I want someone that's vigilant, that is sober, that knows what's, what they're looking for, what the enemy is trying to do. Also part of being vigilant is not being ignorant to Satan's devices, all right? You have to know the avenues of approach that the enemy likes to take on you, likes to take on your family, likes to take on your kids. Know your triggers. In the military, we have this thing called a range card, and I believe they're gonna put a picture of it up there for you guys. So this range card, what that does is anytime we go in and we take a new battle position, we have our people draw a range card. They draw every terrain feature, they draw every building, every road that intersects, they write the distance, the direction, they write the GPS location of it. When we're there, because we know that when the enemy attacks, we need to know what weapon systems to engage him with. We, can, we need to call, know how to call up the Air Force and let them know how to drop bombs. We, know, we need to know how to react to that situation. We don't want to react to the situation as they're attacking us and shooting us. We want to fight on our terms, not their terms. And spiritually, we need to do the same thing. We need to know all the avenues of attack that the enemy likes to take on us personally, on our families, in our relationships, and we have to sit down and we have to come up with a game plan. If it's alcoholism, how are we gonna, how are we gonna combat that, right? Is it the people we're hanging around with? What is it doing that's really driving it? Is it pornography? And every single time, some little commercial now where they got little bathing suits are on there, Right? You gotta turn your head. Why? Because that's an inlet that the enemy likes to use. It, get, it may not be nudity right there, but it's getting something spurred up and start, and start charging. Right? You have to know what it is. Is it finances? Is it family? What triggers does the enemy like to come at you with? And then sitting down and coming up with a game plan. When the enemy comes that way, I gave a pre-designated coordinate for the Air Force and we're dropping a big bomb on it. We're stopping it right in its place. It's not even gonna make it a block. Right? And so very important. And part of that is making sure you have a good offense. In the military, we always do this massive show of force because it scares people from trying to attack you. Right? We're always told if someone comes at you with 1%, you come at them with 100% because then it throws them off. And so in the military, whenever we moved into a new zone or anything like that, if we were leaving three people in a house, it didn't matter. We showed up with 150 people. And then we left maybe three people back to guard the house, but they thought that this massive army was showing up and, and taking over this house. We had a show of force which deterred the enemy from attacking on us. And our show of force is prayer and worship. In fact, in 2 Chronicles, it says, at the very moment they begin to sing and give praise, the Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to start fighting themselves. At the very moment, our offense is to make sure we are diving in. We are reading the word. We are praying. We are listening to the Lord. We are worshiping the Lord, no matter what. The second point that Paul gives us is to stand firm in your faith. This is so important. Any of you guys ever lift weights or lift anything heavy? Right? You have to have a good, firm foundation to lift. And we used to play around in the military all the time when we'd go lift some big stuff. I'd, I'd tell my guys, I said, hey, now the key to this is to take your legs completely out of the equation. Lift with your back at a turning, jerking method. <laughs> Don't go out and do that. Please, nobody go lift like that. That's the exact wrong thing to do but we were just playing around. No, it's the exact opposite. You have, to, you have to have your back straight. You have to get your legs into it. You have to have a strong, firm foundation in order to lift anything. And this strong, firm foundation that God tells us about is trust and confidence. If we have trust and we have confidence in him, we have a strong, firm foundation. What happens is a lot of us throw our back into it. And what does that mean? We put our trust and our confidence in people. And then, well, this is a good Christian person. Why did they do that to me? Why did they hurt me the way they did? 
I was raised in the church. Why did the church do this? And you put so much trust and confidence in people that we unfairly paint their faces onto Jesus' face. Unfairly. Because Jesus tells us that he is faithful to do what he says. He will. We need to quit painting the face of humans onto Jesus. Quit being disappointed by humans. We are always gonna be disappointed by humans. If you think that there's one person in your life that's not gonna disappoint you, then just get it out of the way now. <laughs> At one point or another, humans are gonna hurt you. Someone close is gonna hurt you. But that's not God, and that's not God's will. Jesus loves you, and he is faithful to do what he says. The third point was to be courageous. The world tries to define what courage is, what, what it's supposed to look like. You see all these different uh, social media movies right now. They're trying, if you notice, they're subtly trying to change what normal looks like, right? They're starting to change what marriage looks like. They're trying to change what finances look like. They're starting to change what we're supposed to desire in life, right? It's all me, 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 self-centered stuff right now, which is the opposite of what we're called to do. And that's what the enemy is really good at. He wants to take every single thing that is the exact opposite of what the Lord calls us to do and make that the idol in our life, make that the desire. We are supposed to love others. We're supposed to love the Lord your God. We're not supposed to sit there and, hey, look at me on social media. Uh, I'm tying my shoes today. Yes, I'm, I, I decided to go with the, the pink laces instead of the white laces. Uh, who cares? Right? We are self-centered. And it is time that we focus back on what God called us to focus on, which is him and his relationship. And that takes courage. In fact, listen to this, this dialogue between the prophet Joel and, and the Lord when he was talking about his second coming. He said, I, the Lord, have spoken. Say to the nations far and wide, get ready for war. Call out your best warriors. Let all your fighting men advance for the attack. Hammer your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Train even your weaklings to be warriors. Come quickly, all you nations everywhere. Gather together in the valley, and now, O Lord, call out your warriors, saying, get ready for war. That means every single morning, what my routine, before I hop out of bed, Lord, I'm putting on the helmet of salvation today. My breastplate of righteousness, sandals of peace, belt of truth, and Lord, I'm picking up my sword of the word. I'm not running into battle half naked. I am getting fully dressed every single morning, ready to go ready to go into battle. Lord, use me in every way you can. I know you're gonna put somebody in front of me that I'm gonna be able to minister to, and I need all your armor, I need all your protection, I need your words. I need everything that you have for me right now, Lord. And this is what he's saying. Make sure you are prepared. Make sure you are dressed for battle. Make sure you are courageous in what you do. Don't be afraid to step in and to minister to that one that the Lord puts in front of us. I love it when I, I've done prison ministry forever. I love stepping in there and you got guys that are cussing and yelling and everything else. I feel right at home. I'm like, yeah, man, come on, let it out, let it out. And then I talk to him, you know, Jesus loves you. Ministering to him, don't be scared by those individuals that don't do it. That's what God called us to do. It's easy to stand in here to, to minister to you guys. You guys showed up through the door, right? I can preach all day long at you guys, but let's get outside these walls and let's start taking some ground for the God. Let's start bringing some, let's start flooding these doors every weekend by bringing people who have never been in church or, or have been hurt by church or have been hurt by people. Let's bring them in here and let's show them what love really is. And so <clears throat> one thing that really drives me bonkers, I'll say, 
was I have people all the time that tell me when I minister to them, I'm not clean enough. I, I can't come to church yet. I need to get my stuff squared away. When I get my stuff squared away, I'll come back to church or I'll step through the doors of the church. And I heard someone say this and then the Lord put a picture right away in my head. And he said, if you invite people over to your house, majority of us in here, maybe not all of us, but the majority of us in here are going to clean, right? We are going to pick stuff up, we're gonna vacuum, we're gonna clean the toilets, we're gonna to make sure it looks presentable because we don't wanna be embarrassed when someone else shows up to our house. But if no one's showing up to your house, you let it go. There's clothes on the floor, there's uh, dishes piled in the sink, there's all sorts of stuff going on. So maybe the answer isn't sitting around in your own filth expecting to try and fight through it to get better to be in the Lord's presence. Maybe it's stepping through the doors and realizing by doing that, I'm going to have to clean my house. And it's gonna come along the way. And it's gonna get cleaner, it's gonna get cleaner, it's gonna get cleaner, and you're gonna get involved with other people. And you're gonna have people coming over your house, and now, man, look at this spotless house. Don't even recognize you anymore, all right? Because you've got the presence of the Lord. The fourth point is to be strong. I love this because in Psalm 89, it, it really emphasizes that the Lord is, is, uh, is made glorious through the strength, or through the strength. He loves seeing the strength that he gives in, in us. But the word that is used in Psalm is not a physical strength. It's not a, a power lifting strength. It's not a it's not that, it's actually an empowering strength. So the strength that he's talking about right now is community. He's talking about it excites him to see you disciple, to see you mentor, to see you involved in community. He said you were never supposed to do life by yourself. I love in the LF men, we have this principle we talk about called the fighting diamond. And we took this from the military, one of the, the smallest formation that, the, that you move through when you're, when you're move, doing a uh, movement in the military is a diamond. You have a point man, two wing men, and a rear security. In this fighting diamond, that point man, he's usually your senior team leader. He's someone who's been there, he's seen that, he's, he's done stuff before, so he's got the most experience. He can identify the enemy hiding. He can identify booby traps. He can see stuff because he's got that experience. Spiritually, in your fighting diamond, you need to have a mentor. That's who it is in your life. Somebody you allow to speak into your life, who's been there, who's done that, who has a successful marriage, who is, um, and is speaking into your marriage, who has been successful with finances, who loves the Lord, somebody who can speak life into you. The two wingmen, they're the youngest in the squad, right? Those are go-getters. You say go run into a building, they're running into the building, they don't care. Putting their head down and going. They might not be the most tactfully sound guys, but they are your 2 a.m. buddies. They're the people that you can pick up the phone at two o'clock in the morning and you can say, man, I'm going through it. And they say, hey, don't worry about it. I'm getting out of bed. I'm coming over to your house right now. Let's pray through it. I may not have great knowledge to, to give to you, but I'm gonna be with you. And we're gonna do this together. And we're gonna fight together. Your rear security guy in the military, he holds your radio. When he picks up his radio, big bombs come dropping out of the sky. And so in your spiritual fighting diamond, that's your prayer warrior, right? That's the guy like Elijah. When he picks up the phone and starts calling up to heaven, you're gonna see start fire start raining down. He's got that direct line. And so we challenge everybody to have four people at a minimum, this was the minimum, in your life to walk with. That is the strength that the Psalms are telling us that we need to have. We need to have community. We need to have discipleship. We need to be involved together. The fifth and last point is love. 
Proverbs 21 says, whoever pursues righteousness and unfailing love will find life, righteousness, and honor. This is my favorite verse in the whole entire Bible, Romans 13, 10. It says, love does no wrong to others, so love fulfills the requirements of God's law. There is nothing else. If you're walking out your life with love, doing what you're supposed to do, you will automatically feel God's commandments. You don't have to worry about those hundreds of laws written in the front of the book, right? Jesus tells us, you walk out everything you do in love, you're naturally gonna do everything the right way. Continue to push forward in love. And it reminds me of these, this tribe called the Gurks, right? This tribe, they understood what love was. They understood what courage was. The British came alongside them in the 1964 Malaysia-Indonesian War. And the British said, we will build hospitals for you, schools for you, we will feed your families, we will take care of you if you'll fight alongside of us. And they said, okay, so we will. So they were gonna do this engagement in a high-dense, uh, hard-to-get vehicle location. And the British brought up to the, the Gurk commanders and said, the best way that we see fit to get into this area is to jump out of planes. Would you guys be willing to do that? And so they said, well, we gotta talk about it. We're gonna think about it. So they go and they talk with all the commanders for a day. They come back, and once they come back, they say, okay, we'll do it, but we've got three requests. First request, we want a, the plane to be going as slow as possible when we jump out. British say, yeah, that's no problem. We try and back it down to about 80, 75 miles an hour when we, when we have people jump out anyways. That's not a big issue. Second request, we want to do it after it's rained so the ground is nice and soft so that we get absorbed into the ground when we hit the ground. Said, okay, we can do that. That's not a problem. The third request is we want to jump as low as possible, like treetops if you can. And the British said, no, nah, we can't do that. And I said, why not? And I said, well, it takes 400 feet just for your parachute to open up. And the Gert commanders look at each other and they said, oh, you're going to give us parachutes. We'll jump at anything then. <laughs> <laughs> These guys had so much courage, so much love for their families that they were willing to jump out of a plane without a parachute. What is our excuse? We should be able to, to be fired up like that for the Lord, stepping in, ready to take ground. And that's why it's so important that we make Jesus our Lord and Savior. Today we do it. And one of the saddest verses in the Bible is Romans, or is Matthew 7, 22. It says, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, you prophesied in my name. You cast out demons in my name. You healed in my name. And I will say, turn from me for I never knew you. That to me is sad because you know what that says? That says that it's people that are stepping in the church doors. It's people that are trying to check the block, trying to get fire insurance each week. Because I don't know about you, but before I was saved, I didn't get with my buddies and say, you know what we're gonna do this weekend? We're going to go out and cast out demons in Jesus' name. You guys excited? No, that is Christians. That's what he's talking about. People that are checking the block, that have said, maybe said a prayer, but they don't truly believe it in their heart. And he's saying, no, I need you. I need all of you. And then when I get you, now it's going to be that time to call to action, and I'm going to reveal my glory to you. And so if you would, just bow your heads all across this place. Some of you have been dealing with a massive weight of a cross, and instead of asking the Lord for help, you are trying to muscle it yourself. It is a heavy, tiring, depressing, discouraging. When you try and do it alone, be strengthened in knowing that by stepping up courageously, you will transform not only your life, but also those around you. So Lord, we humbly come before you, acknowledging your sovereignty and grace, we lift our hearts, seeking your guidance and strength for all your children as they journey through life, carrying their crosses with courage. 
Lord, grant us the courage to embrace the cross, recognizing that our trials and challenges, they glorify you, Lord. Instill in us a perseverance that we may not be discouraged by the weight of our crosses, but rather be inspired to carry with unwavering determination. Help us to turn you in moments of doubt, knowing that your strength is made perfect in our weakness. Lord, grant us the wisdom and discernment you will in our lives, the humility to surrender our plans to your divine purpose. In Jesus' mighty name, and if you are away from the Lord right now, and today is the day you need to make the Lord your Lord and Savior, just repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, I come before you to acknowledge my need for salvation. I recognize that I have fallen short and have sinned. I'm in need of your forgiveness and grace. I believe in your son, Jesus, and I accept him as my Lord and Savior. I believe that he died on the cross for my sins and rose again. I repent of my sins and ask for your forgiveness. Come into my heart. Make me a new creation. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Let's celebrate all of those that just went from death to life.